Welcome to the SARS-CoV Updated Situation Report for April 5th, 2020. I'm your host, Dr. Steve, and this is the third in a weekly series. Previous episodes are available and have general information about the current pandemic that are not covered on a weekly basis. Okay, well, let's get started with the current statistics we're following. You can see that the cases in the U.S. are approaching a quarter of a million people known to be affected. Uh, using the uh, asymptomatic data from the Diamond Princess testing we discussed last week that showed a nearly one-to-one ratio of symptomatic to asymptomatic cases. We can get a rough estimate of about 500,000 people currently infected. Those numbers will rise dramatically over the next few weeks as we increase testing, and this is expected, so don't lose hope when you see these numbers increasing over time. They will eventually peak and then begin to taper. Right now, uh, despite these numbers, we're looking at a penetrance of like 0.07% of the population of the U.S., which is still a vanishingly small percentage. This is why we can't uh, rely on herd immunity to get us through this. By the way, just because there aren't enough people with antibodies running around in the community to uh, prevent transmission, vaccination will be the answer to this eventually. You can see Italy's new cases have leveled off and are not doubling anymore, though they still have 4,500 new cases every day. The data in the U.S. shows as slowing and doubling as well. You can look back to March 19th and 20th, where there was a doubling of total cases in one day, and then it took five days to double from uh, uh, 122,000 to today's 241,000. So if you're desperate for evidence that social distancing is working, this is kind of the first hint. Okay, looking at the graphs, we can see more linear increases in China and, indica- and Italy, indicating that exponential expansion is calming down. The more recent data in the U.S. is also becoming more linear, so those are all hopeful signs. Okay, here's the epidemic curve from last week. This came back from a search. And here is the curve from this week, again demonstrating some smoldering in the Western Pacific and some leveling off in Europe. It's still hard to assess the curve in the Americas. Hopefully by next week we can see a trend. Here's the graph of the new cases in Italy, China, and the U.S. I've added a seven-day sample moving average to the U.S. data to smooth out some of the discontinuities that I think are due to reporting bottlenecks. Uh, At least that's my theory on why some of these deep dips exist. Being optimistic, I feel like we're just starting to see the beginning of that left shoulder we're looking for. That will signal the beginning of the peak when it starts to level off and then start to decline. We need to peak, of course, to begin to see tapering. And these indicators, just like the stock market, are all what we call trailing indicators. In other words, they show us where the data has been. They can't predict where it will go. Still, I'm uh, very hopeful. And here's where we were last week and where we are today. I added a line on day 56 to indicate when most states started to mandate closure of businesses uh, where people congregate, which we'll use later when we have a lot more data. And this shy, uh, slide shows where the new graph is in relation to last week, so you can see. Okay, there's some data on hospitalization rate for COVID-19 now. You can see from this slide that there are currently about 4.6 hospitalizations per 100,000 population in the United States. Multiplying that times the population of the U.S. gives us an estimate of about 15,000 hospital admissions. Now, these are absolute numbers and really not an indication of how many percent of COVID patients end up in the hospital. To do that, we need to look at total cases. So taking 241,703 cases and 15,088 hospitalizations gives a hospitalization rate of about 6.24%. This is not entirely accurate as the total cases reflect some people who are very early in the disease. Of course, doesn't take into account patients who have had the disease but haven't even been counted. It does confirm that the hospitalization rate remains very low in proportion to the known cases, however. 
to give this all some perspective, let's say there have been 45 million flu cases, which is a reasonable number given the range of the cases in the U.S. The 242,000 COVID cases pale in comparison to this number, which is also true for hospitalizations and deaths as well, as you can see from the graphic. So people ask me, why are we so bent out of shape if the numbers are so low compared to the flu? Well, the reason is that without mitigation, if this virus penetrated the population to the same extent as influenza, we would have an estimated total of 2.5 million hospitalizations, assuming 40 million people are infected, and about 800,000 deaths. Some estimates have been high as 2.2 million deaths, and these don't include the people who might die because they can't get medical care when the hospitals are so full of COVID patients they can't get in. So strict mitigation will bring this number way down and will save lives. So you are doing your part to save lives when you socially uh, distance and isolate yourself. Just remember... The Roaring Twenties came after the great pandemic of 1918, so we need to survive this so we can rebuild and enjoy the boom that is surely coming afterward. Okay, let's talk about masks for a minute. When this all started, the CDC and this channel didn't recommend that healthy people wear masks. This has changed now that there are increasing cases, and with the knowledge that there are significant numbers of asymptomatic or pre-symptomatic carriers out there. The pre-symptomatic carriers are people who eventually develop symptoms, but haven't yet. And then asymptomatic, we're putting them in a separate category that simply says that these people never had any symptoms at all. The CDC now recommends cloth face coverings when you're going to uh, be in a public setting where social distancing is more difficult, like pharmacies, and grocery stores, especially if you live in an area where community spread is happening. Now, don't wear surgical masks. Please save those for healthcare workers. Uh, but you can use a bandana or a scarf or, you know, a torn up T-shirt. There are websites and YouTube videos on how to make your own. But here's one from our nation's Surgeon General. Well, uh, the audio didn't work very well, so... Uh, I'll just sort of narrate this. What he's saying is you can uh, make uh, covering from a scarf, uh, T-shirts, any kind of thing like that. Uh, first, you just take the cloth and fold it into the middle, and then fold it into the middle again on uh, both sides. And now take uh, two rubber bands, place them uh, uh, on the ends like that, and then... Um, fold it into the center, and now put the uh, the handles over your ears, and now you've got a mask. That works pretty well, and uh, it's perfectly acceptable. Okay, a quick update on testing. You can see the U.S. has ramped up testing, and in fact, testing has increased exponentially in the U.S., which is a good thing. Don't worry about where it says inconsistent units, that disclaimer is talking about the data in the U.S. simply isn't separated between cases, people, repeat tests, etc. It's just a gross number of tests performed. Because we're a big country, our percent of population tested still lags behind Italy, Germany, and South Korea, among others. But I expect that number to rise dramatically over the next two weeks. The Telluride cohort will be very interesting. Telluride, Colorado was approached by a local biomedical company that's developed an antibody test. And they plan to test 100% of citizens who are willing to have the test done, which probably will be mostly everybody. This should be an excellent database to mine for information on rates and timing of infection, transmission rate, contact tracing, and getting a solid asymptomatic case rate as they will be testing everyone on day one and then 14 days later. I really look forward to seeing these results. By the way, kudos to Singapore. They've been singularly effective in stopping the spread of this disease. And when this is all over, we'll learn a lot from this country to prepare us for the battles like this in the future. They've done this by ramping up identification of cases very, very early. Uh, They did extensive and are doing extensive contact tracing where you find a a case and then you find out everyone they came into contact with and just isolated everybody, any potential cases before they could spread the virus to others. They've had a 
1114 cases and only five deaths so far. By the way, <clears throat> can we just ask all the agencies of the world to band together and declare war on all viruses after this? We have the technology to at least start the effort, which we should concentrate on, like the space race in the 60s. This is an achievable goal that no one could possibly be against. Humans have had to deal with plagues throughout our history, and in my humble opinion, enough is enough. Instead of waiting for the next pandemic, let's take the battle to the enemy once and for all. Just an idea from your old pal, Dr. Steve. We discussed fetal and maternal health last time. Just a quick update. This slide is from the last update, indicating a small cohort of pregnant women did not show any particular adverse effects from COVID-19. Data are limited, though, and there's no evidence that pregnant women have a particular problem with this virus, but absence of evidence is not evidence of absence, as we've discussed before. Since pregnant women can be more susceptible to respiratory infections in general, extreme care is... Uh, needed to um, be taken, and, re and, and please report any possible symptoms to your OBGYN or primary care provider, including fever, cough, shortness of breath, etc. All right, let's uh, move on to the medication update. I don't have any vaccine news this week except for the University of Pittsburgh announcement of a vaccine that showed promise in a mouse model. Mice always get all the good drugs first. Since there's an actual vaccine in phase one trials and actual humans, I'll get excited about the Pittsburgh vaccine when it moves to uh, being tested in people. More on that later. We've discussed convalescent serum, which is at heart the transfer of neutralizing antibodies to the virus from a person who is recovered from COVID-19 to someone who needs immunity right away. It could actually be used as a preventative measure in very vulnerable people. And uh, the immune molecules can circulate and provide immunity for weeks, even months. So if we get enough of this stuff, we might even be able to use it in healthcare providers to prevent them from getting it. Because honestly, at less than 1% um, of the population, your risk of actually coming into contact with somebody with COVID-19 is very low. The risk for healthcare workers... Uh, like myself, who are actually seeing these patients is 100% that we're going to get exposed to them. Now, we're using uh, very intense personal protective equipment, uh, N95 masks, face shields, gowns and gloves, and washing our hands like crazy, but um, it's still a concern. So this might be something that um, healthcare workers can use to uh, protect themselves. We'll see. Hydroxychloroquine is showing some promise again. A controlled trial in China looked at 62 patients who were randomized to treatment or placebo and showed statistically significant results in duration of fever, cough, and improved chest CT. There were four patients who deteriorated from mild to severe symptoms, and they were all in the placebo group. If this study can be re uh, reproduced and the results replicated on a large scale, uh, this would argue that early treatment with hydroxychloroquine would be the right strategy. Rather than waiting until patients are so sick that nothing will help them, which was pretty much the case in the most recent hydroxychloroquine study that uh, really didn't show much benefit. It's not a perfect study. The patients all got other treatments and they weren't matched between the groups, but it's still promising and uh, deserves attention. And um, I look forward to seeing these results replicated. Speaking of that, there are at least five trials on hydroxychloroquine plus azithromycin going on and 306 studies total on COVID-19 on clinicaltrials.gov, which is a great website. Check it out. Uh, hopefully we'll get data back sooner rather than later and that will guide us in the treatment of this disease. You know, the perfect world uh, would be for us to find a treatment that prevents hospitalization and death 
to a great degree. If we could even just get the numbers down to influenza numbers or below, we could all go back to work the next day. I mean, the day that we have a, a valid treatment that prevents hospitalization, prevents death, and the medication is readily available, we're all back to work the next day. Hopefully that day will come and we'll stay on it and let you know if something promising is actually proven. I found nine trials for remdesivir on clinicaltrials.gov and at least one that is providing the drug for compassionate use in severe cases. And that's a program where even though it's not approved yet by the FDA and efficacy hasn't been proven, uh, they can supply folks with the drug if everything else has failed. So we'll have more on this drug as the data finally rolls in. Okay, happening this week, more data as always. The antibody tests have been shipped and should have arrived this week in multiple locations. Uh, look for lots of data to roll in on people who have had the disease and never knew it who are now immune. It remains to be seen how significant the possible cross-reactivity with other coronaviruses is, though. So a positive IgG test wouldn't give me 100% certainty that that person is free from any risk within this pandemic. Hopefully we'll have guidance on the use of these tests outside Simple Curiosity this week, and I'll report on that uh, uh, next Sunday. Remember, seek attention if you develop any of the warning signs of severe disease, including chest pressure, delirium, shortness of breath, blue lips or face, which we call cyanosis because we have to have a fancy name for everything in medicine. Call your health care provider if you have any questions or concerns. For those of you who had COVID-19 and have recovered, you can leave home after you've had no fever for three days and you're asymptomatic, and it's been at least seven days since this whole thing started for you. There's a protocol for people who are getting uh, retested, but that probably won't be the norm for most people for a while, so we'll discuss it once we have an overabundance of tests. As always, stay healthy, distance yourself from others, wash your hands with soap and water for at least 20 seconds, and use gel if you don't have soap and water. Wear a cloth covering when you go out, particularly if you're going to a place where social distancing is difficult. Cough into your elbow and then don't touch elbows. Don't touch anything on anybody ever again. How about that? Can we just agree to do that? We need to learn to bow. Or just not acknowledge each other. That would be fine, too. Follow me on Twitter, at Weird Medicine. Listen to our podcast on Riotcast.com or iTunes or on SiriusXM Faction Talk. On demand or Saturday nights at 8 p.m. Eastern. That's Channel 103. See you next week for the next edition of the Weird Medicine COVID-19 Situation Report. Stay healthy, everyone. I've got a bowl of bones dripping from my nose. I've got the leprosy of the heart bone. Exacerbating my incredible woes. I want to take...